Our second scripture today is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Familiar words that uh, we know from Messiah. <laughs> comfort, O oh, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead the mother's sheep. Looking back over my life, I can think of few times when we needed tender, comforting words more than we need them these days. Of course, we can begin with the, the immediate walk outside. And we cough, and our eyes itch and water. You can taste the air. And it's not a happy taste, is it? And of course, those are small issues for most folk. Other folk, lots of other folk, find themselves afraid that their homes will be gone, that all of the things that have given their lives meaning and stability are gone. I was talking this morning with Charlie, and he said that the area that's being threatened right now has not burned in between 50 and 60 years. So there's an awful lot of uh, fuel there and waiting, waiting to burn and cause more problems. And all of those folk have that fear of loss, staring them in the faces and the horrors of those possibilities. And then, on top of that, they hear about a new tax plan that's trying to get passed that would make it so they can't even deduct losses that they experience. Maybe they've heard some of the reports from up in the Santa Rosa area from around the Tubbs fire. I didn't think of it at the time very much, but the uh, median rental price in that area in the days after the fire went up by over 25%. With some, some rentals, a four bedroom house renting for as much as $12,000 a month. And then, the construction costs, which are already higher in these areas than in much of the country, went up by double, over $600 per square foot for construction costs. And so someone who even had their home insured adequately suddenly could no longer afford 
to rebuild it because the costs were too high. We need tender words. We need tender words. And then not only the folk who lost their homes up there in what was affectionately called the Northern California Firestorm, those in the Caribbean and along the Gulf, Gulf Coast who had lost their homes not that long ago to hurricanes, need tender words. We need tender words about our politics. I have talked about it way too much. And I'm tired of talking about it, but there's still so much to be said. We need tender words. We need tender words. I almost laughed yesterday to think that the tensions with North Korea have taken a back burner to all of the other craziness going on. And then dog whistles to crazy evangelicals in the talk of moving our embassy to Jerusalem, which, if it happens, will likely lead to war. And the dog whistle, of course, is that for many of those evangelicals who believe that that is necessary for the, for the return of Jesus to happen, they're excited about the possibilities of war and even hopeful that it will happen. We need tender words. You pick up a newspaper, turn on your computer, and it seems every day there is another powerful man accused of sexual harassment. We need tender words. Gender, race, ethnicity, religion, all are intensifying as dividers and keeping us apart breaking us down into different factions. We need tender words. And then, then we get to the personal stuff. Every Sunday we do our prayer list, and if nothing else, it is a, a cry to hear tender words. A cry for comfort, for hope. And there are those things that don't get lift, lifted in the prayer requests. Many of us have our own health issues. Some of us wrestle with what's going to happen for future directions for our lives, and we're not quite sure where we're going to go or how we'll get there. Some of us struggle with our relationships, whether we speak those words or not. All of us find ourselves sometimes being less than what we desire to be, and we need tender words, comforting words, hopeful words. You need those words. And I need those words. Well, the prophet Isaiah's audience needed tender words as well. That's why God speaks to the prophet and says, speak comforting words to my people. A generation prior, Babylon had destroyed their social fabric. All of the institutions that held their lives together were torn out from underneath them, whether it be their community, their families, their government, their religious bodies, all of it destroyed. And the Babylonian army had rolled in, killing, burning, destroying, taking some of the younger people off as slaves, taking all of the leaders of their society and sending them into exile across the Babylonian Empire, everything was destroyed. Well, people are resilient. They were resilient. There they were in exile. There they were, some of them left behind, but all of their friends and social networks destroyed, and new people brought in who didn't speak their language, eat their food, dress their clothing, and they built new relationships. 
They built a new community wherever they found themselves. They raised their family, they watched as their children grew and, and fell in love and, fought, and formed their own new families. But behind all of that, there was still a yearning, still a hunger for that place that was theirs, that place where their roots held firm, that place where they had a history and a sense of God's presence, a sense of peace. But by this time for them, it was just a dream. They knew you can't go home again. It's not the same. Home was gone. And there they were in, in this Babylonian diaspora, and they looked around and they watched as their children intermingled and found a new place in the world. Their identity, identity as a people began to melt away. Suddenly they weren't Jews versus Babylonians anymore. They were whatever they were. It had all changed. Another generation or two, these elders of the community looked around and thought, Israel will be nothing but a footnote left in Babylon's history. One more little unimportant nation destroyed by this juggernaut of Babylon's power. Everything was gone. There was no hope of return. And so they hung on where they were. And, and of course, on top of that, there were all of the normal problems that people have. People got sick. Natural disasters came their way. People got older and watched as they lost some of the abilities that had defined who they were as people. Life went on. And so Isaiah hears God speak, and God says, Isaiah, speak to the people. Tell them comforting things. Speak tender words to them. Tell them, yes, your suffering is over. God is calling you home, and God will make a path through the desert as easy as it can possibly be. That God will miraculously lead you back through the wilderness to a land of milk and honey and shalom. God is at work. And Isaiah spoke those words. And the story tells us that indeed those words were filled full. Those comforting words took shape in their lives. And they experienced God's redemption as those who chose to went back to their homeland and rebuilt it. Isaiah spoke to them of God's comfort and said, embrace this new vision, find this new hope, see these new possibilities, even where it looks as if there are none, because God will lead you forward. When I read the passage this week, I found myself thinking that maybe God speaks the exact same words to us that God spoke, not to the people, necessarily, but to Isaiah. That our role, if we are truly people who are shaped by the gospel, I love the way Mark's gospel began in the reading that Nancy did. This is the beginning of the good news. If we are good news people, we are called to speak tender words. To speak good news when good news is hard to find. To speak comforting words when people need to be comforted. That's our call. Now, I have to say, that's hard for me. That's hard for me. And, and as a kind of an example of that, I was looking the other day at, at going back over my Facebook posts. <laughs> Not, not much comfort or tenderness there. And I remember that a couple of years ago, I was doing the same thing, but I made a commitment to myself, every day I'm going to put at least one thing up on Facebook, at least one thing that is good news. 
One thing that makes me smile, one thing that makes me happy, one thing that makes me think there is yet hope in this world, and I stopped. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I try only to post things that are true. I, I try to be careful about that. And, and I, I try to be fair with I, when I post things. I don't just copy stuff that I read and say, oh, I agree with that, so it must be true. I, I try to be fair. But the reality is it's still, if you go through my feed, it's not a, it's not a tender place. And, and it's not just on my Facebook thing. I haven't been blogging very much at all the last year or so. Well, I did a blog post maybe three weeks ago. And, and looking back at it, I thought, oh man, why did I do that? I, I, I was being honest, I did what I felt. I, I called some of my liberal friends on the carpet, those who didn't vote for Hillary, because she wasn't pure enough. And I called them on the carpet and said, they have to realize that they are complicit in what is happening. It was anything but tender. <laughs> anything but tender. And in the midst of all of that stuff, thinking about all of those, I don't know, what do you call them, not tender words of mine, I, I remembered one of my mentors in seminary, uh, Bob Chalky. He was my, my uh, supervisor at the mental hospital. And one of the first things Bob said to us, Chalky actually, everybody called him, even his wife by his last name. One of the first things Chalky said to his students was, now, you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful because the more time you spend in the mental hospital, you start to see everything through that lens. And everybody's crazy. Because that's what you see. And, and we know that. That happens in, in, in every area of life. If you talk to police officers, it doesn't take very long before everybody they see who's not a police officer is a criminal. Because that's the world they live in. And Chokey said, you've got to be careful of that. You've got to be careful that everybody doesn't become crazy. Because they're not. So you've got to be sure that you balance what you see in the mental hospital with what you experience outside. And, and I think the exact same thing true is, is, is true in our thought lives. Where we live in our thoughts is what we see. And so, if, if all I speak and all I look for are the negative things, indeed, that is all I will see and that is all I will find. If all I do when I go online is look for stuff that Donald Trump is doing that's wrong, guess what? I'm going to find it. <laughs> Doesn't take long. Doesn't take long. Doesn't take long. On the other hand, if I start looking for tender words, if I start looking to see where the Spirit of God is at work, if I start looking for good news, guess what? I'm going to find that too. It doesn't mean the other stuff has gone away. It doesn't mean I even don't see it. But it lets me see things in a different way. And, and, an example of that is we've had all of these, these men accused of, of sexual harassment. And that is horrible, horrible. But it's also good news. Because for the first time in my lifetime, we have women who are able to stand up and say, you know what, this is not right that this happened to me. And somebody's going to pay attention to it. That's good news. Because that's the first step to us getting to the place where we can actually say, you know what, we're not going to have this happen in our society anymore. And if we don't talk about it, we'll never get there. So we can find the good news even where it doesn't always look like good news. You know, I think in, poli in politics, our presidential elections are just like pastors in Baptist churches. You know, when, when a pastor gets called, there's always a pendulum, and every pastor is pretty much exactly the opposite of the one that was before him. Right? Right? Pretty much. And, and you can see that now, can't you? But the hope in that is the pendulum's going to swing. <laughs> it's going to swing. We need to see the tender words. 
the good things. We need to hear and live the good news, and then our call is to speak it. We need to realize that God is at work. That's what Advent is all about. We've got two candles lit today. Next Sunday we'll have three. The Sunday after that we'll have four. And Christmas Eve we light the fifth candle to say that God is coming and God is here. God is at work. No matter how dark things seem to be, that's why they put Christmas so close to the winter equinox. It's not when Jesus was actually born, but symbolically it really works. Because just when things are the darkest, suddenly the light comes and the days start to get longer again. Right in the bleak midwinter, hope comes. Hope comes. We need to see that good news. As we live in this fractured society, we need to keep reminding ourselves that God breaks down those barriers. One of the most wonderful observations that I've ever read about Christianity is that Christianity is the only religion that speaks every language. If you're a Muslim and you want to read the Quran and really read it, you have to read it in Arabic. Because in English, that is literally no longer the Quran. If you want to be a Jew, you have got to read the scripture in Hebrew. Indeed, how do you mark adulthood when you become a Jew? You have a ceremony where you stand up and you read the scripture to all of your family and friends in Hebrew. Christianity, God speaks to us in our own languages. Whatever they are. Period. And I would bet that if you went in most churches across the world and asked what language did Jesus speak, most people wouldn't even know the answer. They wouldn't know the answer. And then if you ask them what language was the Bible written in, again, they probably wouldn't know the answers. And you notice I said answers, because there's more than one. God comes to us where we are. And all of those things that would keep us apart, God says, no, 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 no. No. None of that matters. None of that matters. I don't care if you're Jew, or Greek, male, or female, slave, or free. I don't care. Those don't matter. There are evil and violent people out there who do evil and violent things. Can't get around that. But guess what? The power of God's love overcomes all of it. Even the power of death. Even the power of death. Sometimes you and I are less than what we're supposed to be. Sometimes when I know that I'm supposed to be the one saying those tender words, those good news words, I'm out there spewing bile. <laughs> And God smiles at me and says, oh boy. <laughs> Try a little harder. Our politics. This is a hard one for me. God is not a democratic socialist. <laughs> God is not a Democrat. God is not a Republican. God is not even an American. God is not even an American. Instead, God is yearning for a world of justice, of peace, of hope, of potential for everyone in it so that each individual can fulfill who and what they have been created to be. And God is pushing the universe in that direction. It's slow. Boy, is it slow. But it is happening. All of us have 
the realization that our lives don't always go the way we would like. Sometimes things just happen. Sometimes it's because, again, we're less than what we are supposed to be, what we want to be. And, and, and you know what? Every single one of us here suffers from a sexually transmitted and fatal disease. Life. <laughs> and we will all die. But God is there, each and every moment, through the whole thing, from the first cry to the last breath. And our call as good news people is to remember those tender words, that good news, and to speak it. To speak again and again that God is good. All, all the time. time. Now, I want you to do that again. And God loves us. All, all the time. time. And, and, and God is at work. All, all the time. Because God is good. All, all the time. time. And God is shaping and changing and moving the world until the kingdom of God comes in its fullness. And our place, part of our place in all of that, is to speak the good news, to hold those tender words in our hearts, in our hands, in our mouths, and share them with others. Comforting words, words of hope, eyes that see what God is doing. And that is good news. That is good.